Hello friends and welcome to the next topic in our series that is Anatomy of Bone and Fracture Healing. My name is Dr. Pratik Zoshi and the name of this channel is Rapid Revision of Orthopedics by Dr. Pratik Zoshi. Now before we start, if anyone has not subscribed to the channel as yet, please subscribe and please hit on the bell icon so that as and when I make a new topic, it will be delivered directly to you. Now before we actually start on this topic, there may be a couple of slides in this PowerPoint which may appear too theoretical or it may appear that there's a lot of text on the slide. Now as in when you get this kind of a slide, please pause the video and please write down what is there on the slide or you can screenshot it if you want because these are carefully curated and carefully compiled keywords which I have um, paraphrased from standard textbooks of orthopedics and these are the words which you should have in your theory answer or these are the words which you should mention when you're answering a viva examination on this topic so this is not only a um, set of words which will fetch you your marks which is of course one of the purposes of revision but also these are very specific and scientific words which will sum up a large amount of the topic so please screenshot or please write down as in when you get a slide like this so let us start and uh, the first part of the lecture is on anatomy of bone. Now uh, from a clinical perspective there are two things which we need to know in anatomy of a bone. First is the anatomical or geographical regions of a bone and the second is a type of epiphysis which are of four types as we remember from first year anatomy that is pressure epiphysis, traction epiphysis, aberrant epiphysis and atavistic epiphysis. So starting of this the, four re the three regions of the bone are Firstly is the epiphysis. Now epiphysis is the growing end of the bone. In a pediatric bone, this is the, uh, the end of the bone which is responsible for maximum growth. It is very well perfused and very well vascularized and it is separated from the next region which is the metaphysis by an area called as the epiphyseal plate. Now epiphyseal plate or epiphyseal cartilage separates the epiphysis from the metaphysis. Now metaphysis is the region of the bone next to the epiphysis it is a spongy and a cancellous bone and it is also extremely well perfused now in addition to the epiphyseal arteries which are supplying the epiphysis of the bone the metaphysis also supplies the epiphysis via diffusion directly through the epiphyseal cartilage now in a pediatric bone the epiphyseal cartilage is quite thick and it can be seen on the x-ray as a gap between the epiphysis and the metaphysis but as the person grows and becomes skeletally mature, the epiphyseal cartilage or the epiphyseal line thins out and remains as a single sclerotic line and the epiphysis and the metaphysis appear to be connected to each other. And this sclerosis or the closure of the epiphyseal cartilage into a single sclerotic epiphyseal line is the hallmark of skeletal maturity. Moving on, from the metaphysis to the inferior or the distal metaphysis, the shaft of the bone is called as the diaphysis. And the diaphysis is the strongest and the longest part of the bone and it also receives the main nutrition of the bone that is the nutrient artery which enters the bone through the nutrient foramen. Now before we go on to the pediatric bone, what we have to see is the types of epiphysis. There are four types of epiphysis which is first is a pressure epiphysis. A pressure epiphysis is an epiphysis or a growing end of the bone which is involved directly in weight bearing or weight transmission. So as the bone grows at the epiphysis, not only does it grow in size but also the epiphysis remodels as per the patterns of weight distribution it takes and the most prominent example is the head of the femur. So the head of the femur or the epiphysis of the head of the femur is a pressure epiphysis. It is involved in weight bearing as it is a part of the hip joint. The next type of epiphysis is called a traction epiphysis which means it is an epiphysis where there is a lot of muscular attachment. So as the bone grows and as the bone takes part in weight transmission and in movement, the epiphysis gets molded according to the muscle pull being exerted on it. So an example of traction epiphysis would be greater and lesser trochanters of the femur. The other two types of epiphysis are one is an aberrant epiphysis which is a uh, an anomaly or a mistake or an epiphysis which is a uh, novelty in itself. For example, the epiphysis of the first metatarsal of the foot is an aberrant epiphysis and the last type is an atavistic epiphysis that is an ep uh, epiphysis which is phylogenetically a separate bone but with the process of evolution it has joined with the parent bone and the most common example of 
atavistic epiphysis is the coracoid process of scapula. Now moving on to the pediatric bone. As we can see this area is the epiphysis. It is well perfused and separated from the metaphysis by a um, epiphyseal plate. This area is called as the metaphysis and the metaphysis is an area of cancellous or spongy bone as we can see and it is also very well vascularized and the metaphysis forms the connection between the epiphysis at the growing end of the bone and the diaphysis which is the shaft of the bone. As you can see the diaphysis is far denser than the metaphysis or the epiphysis and also here we can see the nutrient vessel entering the bone at the nutrient foramen. Now for the microanatomy of the bone. Now an adult bone is divided into two types of bone. Now 80% of the adult bone is compact. It is well lamellated and it is a high density bone that is called as a cortical bone. So cortical or compact bone is 80% of the adult skeleton. The remaining 20% is a spongy or a woven bone which is called as the cancellous bone. Now, cancellous bone is not only spongy and woven but also it forms most of the metaphysis of the body whereas cortical bone is the bone which replaces the uh, epiphyseal cartilage which forms all the mature bone and cortical bone is responsible for weight bearing, it is responsible for the strength of the bone and it is responsible for most of the muscular activity involving the bone. The metaphysis in itself being an area of spongy and cancellous bone, it is very vascular and it is important in bone healing as well as bone remodeling. Now, moving on to the actual microanatomy, let's take a look at the two-dimensional picture. Starting with two dimensions, what we can imagine, an adult bone is like a large pipe in which you have many small pipes which are densely packed. So let's magnify this a little bit and this is the outer cortex of the bone which is basically the wall of the large pipe. The wall of the large pipe as you can see it is not a single layer but it is multiple layers these are called as circumferential lamellae. Now inside this is the inner cortex or the inner part of the cortical bone and as you can see these are the small pipes which are packed together very tightly. These are called as osteons. Now let us magnify this a little further and we can see that an osteon in itself is also not made of a single wall but it is also a circumferential and lamellated structure but these lamellae are called as concentric lamellae. Now concentric lamellae form concentric circles and inside of this they enclose the cavity of the osteon which is the, the um, haversian canal. Now the outermost concentric lamella forms the limiting area or the limiting layer of a single osteon and that is called as the cement line. So the cement line is the limiting layer of the osteon. Now inside the haversian canal you will have the intraosseous vasculature consisting of an artery and a vein. So the osteon limited by the cement line having the haversian canal in its center carrying the intraosseous vasculature is the single smallest unit of the bone. Now let's take a 3D look at the entire thing. Here you can see these are circumferential lamellae. Circumferential lamellae are forming the outer cortex of the bone. The outer cortex is enclosing multiple osteons which are packed tightly. The cavity of the osteon is the haversian canal and haversian canal has the intraosseous vasculature. Now couple of things which we didn't see in the two dimensional drawing is here in the three dimensions you can see the haversian canal and the osteon in cut section. Now the haversian canals communicate with each other and by extension the, um, the osteons communicate with each other through transverse canals which are called as Hochman's canals. And as you can see Hochman's canals also allow perforating branches of the intraosseous vasculature. Here we can see that most of the cortical bone is in the outer thickness of the bone and inside you have the spongy bone which is soft and woven bone.
moving on we have to study now the fracture morphology now fracture morphology is divided into four different types of classifications let's take a look at them first one is as per the fracture location whether it is epiphyseal metaphyseal or diaphyseal the next would be joint involvement that is extra articular partial articular or complete articular third is as per orientation or how the fracture line lies with respect to the longitudinal axis of the bone and that could be transverse oblique or spiral and the fourth one is as per the complexity depending on how the bone is broken into one piece into multiple pieces or anything in between so i would recommend you write this down so that this can be the uh, the four headings under which we will study fracture morphology so let's draw them the first one is fracture location now fracture location can be epiphyseal it can be metaphyseal or it can be diaphyseal now epiphyseal fractures take a very important place in pediatric orthopedics because epiphysis being the growing end of the bone it will cause irreversible deformities if epiphyseal fractures are not accurately reduced and fixed on an emergent basis and therefore a very important part of epiphy of uh, pediatric orthopedics is epiphyseal fractures moving on metaphyseal fractures also have their own important place because of the predominance of cancellous spongy bone in the metaphysis and the high amount of vasculature metaphysis is the nidus for remodeling and therefore the best results of remodeling in pediatric fractures are seen in metaphyseal fractures pediatric fractures in general depending on the site and the type of fracture they may be amenable to conservative or operative management but epiphyseal fractures in general require urgent reduction and in many cases fixation in order to prevent any such deformity or late stage complications as the child grows metaphyseal fractures are the nidus for remodeling moving on for joint involvement now the simplest type of fracture is a fracture which does not involve the joint so it is an extra articular fracture any fracture not involving the joint the other fracture is articular which can be partial articular or complete articular a partial articular fracture is one where the fracture line extends into the joint leaving behind one piece which is the smaller fragment which is detached from the rest of the bone and the major fragment is attached to the rest of the parent bone this is called as a partial articular fracture whereas a complete articular fracture is one where not only the joint line is compromised by the fracture but also both the fracture fragments are separated from the parent bone this is a complete articular fracture now going on to the orientation of the fracture line the fracture line could be transverse which means it lies perpendicular to the long axis of the bone or it could lie at an angle with the long axis of the bone which makes it an oblique or it could be following a sine wave pattern across the surface of the bone and that is called as a spiral fracture now some authors are likely to make a difference between short oblique and long oblique depending on the angulation of the fracture line now the importance of seeing the angulation of the fracture line is that the longer the length of the fracture line the greater is the surface area for the fracture fragments and if these fracture fragments are well united well opposed or well reduced then a fracture with a greater opposed surface area of the bone will have a greater healing potential and better post operative results now last point is fracture complexity where a single or a simple fracture is where there is one fracture line dividing the bone into two parts now the second is a wedge fracture where the bone is divided into three parts where there is one proximal main fragment one distal main fragment and both of them are connected by a triangular fragment called as a wedge also called as a butterfly fragment now the butterfly fragment should be well opposed and well reduced in order to ensure stability of the bone if the butterfly fragment is mal reduced it will lead to post operative complications and the last type is a comminuted type where the fracture site is 
larger and the bone is broken in multiple pieces and comminuted fractures have a significantly high amount of malunion and nonunion as compared to wedge fractures or simple fractures. So let's take a look at a couple of x-rays. This is a transverse fracture line. This is an oblique fracture line which is at an angle with the longitudinal axis of the bone. This is also an oblique fracture line and this is a spiral fracture line. Now what we can say is that this particular angle is a little less than this particular angle. So figure B could be a short oblique fracture and figure C could be a long oblique fracture. Another picture, this is a simple fracture where the bone is broken into just two pieces. This is a wedge fracture with this highlighted part being the butterfly fragment and this is a comminuted fracture. See the length of the fracture line is quite a lot and the number of pieces is also quite a lot. It is difficult to achieve anatomic reduction in a fracture like this and even if it is because of the lack of acquisition and the lack of continuity of the bone, it is likely that there is a lot of chances of non-union and malunion. Now moving on to the section of pathoanatomy and healing of a fractured bone. Now this is the section of this particular powerpoint which is likely to have a little more text in the slide and as and when you see the text please pause the video and screenshot it or write it down. They will form the bulk of what you are supposed to write in the exam or what you are supposed to talk about in the viva examination. So first let us start with the cellular components of fracture healing. Now the outermost layer of the bone is called as periosteum and the innermost layer is called as the endosteum. Now what is common between these two layers is that both of them have cells which can differentiate either into osteoblast lineage or they can differentiate into chondroblast lineage depending on the mechanical and the local requirement. So they are pluripotent cells. So pluripotent cells can give rise to either chondroblast or osteoblast out of which periosteum provides a good mixture of both and endosteum predominantly gives osteoblast lineage. This is an MCQ point and that is osteoblast lineage is more than uh, chondroblast lineage in pluripotent cells arising from endosteum. Now the question is as we said pluripotent cells will become either endosteum or uh, they, they will become I am sorry they would become either osteoblast or chondroblast depending on the mechanical requirement. Mechanical requirement is decided by the mechanical stability. We will get to this in just some time. The next is chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are the cartilage forming cells and they form the extracellular matrix such as proteoglycans and type 2 collagen and they will contribute to ossification inside a cartilage that is endochondral ossification. The third are the bone forming cells that is osteoblasts and the bone eating cells that are the osteoclasts. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts they have a function which is a mirror image of each other or they have a reciprocal function and they work in tandem and they direct the bone growth. So osteoblasts and osteoclasts the ratio of their activity has a uh, special role when it comes to ossification of the cartilage matrix and remodeling of the bone in terms of long term healing. Other components which are involved are inflammatory cells, mesenchymal cells and of course the muscle envelope surrounding the bone which will provide the first amount of mechanical stability just immediately after the fracture. Now moving on, there are three pieces of terminology which we should know before we start talking about fracture healing in situ. Now if you want a fracture to heal, firstly there is a hematoma which immediately forms as soon as the fracture occurs. Now what you would like is that you would like specialized cells which can form a cartilage and later a bone to actually gather at the fracture site. Once that has happened, you would like those specialized cells to move across and create a bridge or create a scaffold across the fracture site which will form a mechanical bridge for the bone forming cells to move up and down. And once this bridge is created, you would like the bone forming cells to move up and down and form new bone on top of this bridge so that you are joining the two ends of the bone again. So these are the three terms which we need to know. The first one is osteoinduction that is recruitment and differentiation of pluripotent mesenchymal stem cells into bone forming osteoprogenitor cells. This is done by the action of bone morphogenic protein and some other growth factors. So this is the point where you would like to have a lot of specialized cells gathering at the fracture site. 
the next terminology is osteoconduction which means once these cells have gathered you would like to form a bony bridge or a cartilaginous bridge first which would allow the growth of blood vessels and the growth of these cells and which would connect the two fracture fragments this is osteoconduction that is creation of the bony scaffolding which supports ingrowth and migration of osteoprogenitus cells osteoblasts and blood vessels along with perivascular tissue so it is like building a bridge across which the trucks full of supplies and bricks and cement will go and they will start creating the actual bone and the third is the osteogenesis which is the process of new bone formation by osteoblast which will occur after their differentiation from the bone forming osteoprogenitor cells so once the bridge is formed the osteoblasts will move across the bridge and create bone which will join the fracture site so as we spoke about mechanical stability now mechanical stability at the fracture site is decided by the amount of motion which is present at the fracture site and that is given by perrin's law of interfragmentary strain now interfragmentary strain is a differential of the amount of motion present at the fracture site which means the change in the fracture gap width as a differential of the original fracture gap width and this is expressed as a percentage so please note down this table if the interfragmentary strain is less than 2% we have managed to provide an absolute stability at the fracture site and what we will get is anatomic reduction followed by bridging callus across the fracture site and the bone will have healed by primary intention now if the value of interfragmentary strain which means this differential is between 2% to 10% then there will be irregular hypertrophic callus the callus will be formed but it will not be healing by primary intention it will be healing by secondary intention and the third is when there is excessive motion at the fracture site or there is a change in fracture gap width which is excessive as compared to the original fracture gap width leading to an interfragmentary strain of more than 10% then there will be only granulation tissue which is formed and there will be either delayed union if the uh, interfragmentary strain is reduced later on then union can start if the interfragmentary strain consistently remains above 10% the bone is going to go into non union moving on the first stage of fracture healing is called as the hematoma stage now each of these four to five slides has four to five points each and these are the points which have to be mentioned first one is that why would there be a hematoma hematoma refers to local bleeding so as soon as there is a fracture the bone is disturbed as we saw in the local anatomy the intraosseous vasculature is disturbed the periosteal vasculature is disturbed and the bone marrow vasculature is also disturbed because of which in the fracture site between the two fracture fragments there will be accumulation of blood now once there is accumulation of blood there will be firstly increased local pressure next would be there would be anaerobic respiration causing a local acidosis and since there is a lot of blood accumulated in one place there will be a local rise of calcium phosphorus and alkaline phosphatase now i would like to draw your attention to the word local which is thrown around quite frequently here it is local which means the acidosis increased pressure increased calcium increased phosphorus do not correlate with a similar increase in systemic or plasma levels all the changes are local now there is also an increase again in the local concentration of interleukins that is interleukin 6 interleukin 8 cytokines tumor necrosis factor alpha and other bone growth factors now since this is a local increase again you will not find a similar systemic increase in all these factors and that is why the hematoma is called bioactive in a recent study done on a rabbit model the uh, hematoma was removed and instead a simple blood clot of the same size was placed in the fracture site however this blood clot refused to bring about any sort of union and that is why the hematoma is called as bioactive and the local inflammatory response is incited by the presence of all these interleukins and cytokines and the mcq point here is first cells to arrive at the fracture site are neutrophils and they will arrive as early as 3 hours now this is a fresh x-ray of fracture distal end radius and the fracture distal end radius here you can see apart from the fracture site not much changes of hematoma formation can be seen and therefore the next point to remember here is that the stage of hematoma which lasts for the first 72 hours is radiologically inapparent which means apart from the fracture itself 
and the soft tissue changes now if you can see the diameter of this soft tissue is quite broad which means there is a large amount of local swelling also you can see that there is a considerable deformity here so apart from soft tissue changes you cannot see any evidence of hematoma formation and therefore the stage of hematoma formation is apparent only histologically and not radiologically moving on the next phase is the formation of soft callus which occurs in the first one to three weeks now the pathological or the histological basis of this is the differentiation of progenitor cells into chondrocytes and chondroblasts which means according to the definition it is osteoinduction mechanical stability promotes osteoblast differentiation which means that if we maintain the interfragmentary strain to a level of less than two percent then it, there will be more osteoblast formation as compared to chondroblast formation and therefore the bony healing will be faster and it will be better and it will be in the lines of anatomical reduction next is that fibrous tissue and the remaining hematoma is replaced by cartilagen osteoid which means now we have the fracture site which has been bridged by cartilagen osteoid and that is osteoconduction or it is the scaffolding which is being formed on top of which the bone forming cells are going to migrate third is that the uh, once the scaffolding is formed the cartilage starts forming over there by the action of chondroblast that is type 1 and type 2 collagen which provides a certain soft tissue stability to the fractured ends now always this is a stability of soft tissue because till the first three weeks bony formation has not begun bony formation will begin by the end of the third week so most of these are cartilaginous changes and therefore the union again is apparent histologically that is in a cut specimen we will be able to see grossly the cartilage which is bridging the fracture site it can be confirmed microscopically by the presence of chondrocytes and chondroblasts however not a lot of changes will be seen on the x-ray maximum what we can see is at the end of the third week early mineralizing callus will give a fluffy appearance on the x-ray so in summary of this slide mechanical stability will decide how much osteoblast formation happens and how much uh, chondroblast formation happens and if, if it is less than two percent interfragmentary strain vast majority will be osteoblast the chondroblast will form the scaffolding and are responsible for osteoinduction which is apparent histologically but not radiologically now as we can see this is a uh, lateral view of fracture shaft humerus and here what you can see is a fluffy appearance of early mineralizing callus moving on to the third stage that is the formation of hard callus this occurs from the end of the first month over complete set of say six to nine months so it is the conversion of the soft callus into a calcified cartilage matrix and terminal differentiation of chondrocytes which means as the fracture heals the stability at the fracture site goes on increasing therefore there is less and less motion and interfragmentary strain goes on decreasing towards the less than two percent range because of which there will be more and more osteoblast and less and less cartilage related cells and the existing chondrocytes will also be terminally differentiated and they will form calcified cartilage matrix which we can see as healing bone now osteoblasts and osteoclasts are the dominant cell types because the interfragmentary strain has now reduced and therefore osteoblasts and osteoclasts with their reciprocal actions will try to not only heal the bone but also there will be an onset of remodeling so the hard callus stage and the remodeling stage are stages which overlap with each other and often changes of both can be seen together now the union is visible radiologically as well as histologically so radiologically we can very clearly see calcification and consolidation of newly formed bone and histologically of course newly formed bone will be visible it is also visible clinically because there is a clear diminution of the pain and till the soft callus stage where there is abnormal mobility at the fracture site this is significantly reduced as we approach the hard callus stage the fracture site is almost totally bridged by the newly formed bone and there is only one histological difference which is apparent microscopically and that is stress induced patterns are absent which means that the lamination of the bone which is occurring because of wolf's law that is there is lamination according to the lines of stress transmission is absent in the newly formed bone now as we can see here 
this is the fracture site it is almost completely bridged by newly formed bone we can see that there is a lot of opacity here which means calcification has started in earnest and this is the hard callus stage clinically it will be accompanied by lack of pain and there will be a good amount of reduction in abnormal mobility at the fracture site the last stage is remodeling stage it occurs over months to years and often it will overlap with the hard callus stage and here the, there is re-establishment of canaliculi and haversian system so the bone which was newly formed will now connect across the fracture site through the haversian system and the canaliculi there will be intraosseous vascularity which is established across the fracture site through the newly formation newly formed bone and as and when the patient starts weight bearing histologically there will be onset of reappearance of the stress patterns which are formed because of wolf's law also reciprocal actions of osteoblast and osteoclast will continue and there is a new bone formation at the same time there is bone resorption and therefore slowly and steadily over the process of years the bone will try to achieve as much of an anatomical or a normal shape as possible this is called as the remodeling stage this is an x-ray of shaft tibia fracture approximately a year into follow-up and as we can see the fracture site is now nearly remodeled the body is attempting to bring the fracture site into the anatomical axis of the bone so this is a stage of remodel so this was the topic about the bony anatomy and the science of fracture healing thank you for listening my contact email is in the channel information if you have any doubts please leave them in the comments or you can hit me up on facebook or instagram and of course like share and subscribe and hit the bell icon so that next time i upload a topic it will be delivered directly to you thank you